Our next speaker is Dr. Jane Ladlow, who has almost 20 years of experience as a specialist in small animal surgery, clinician, researcher, teacher, and lecturer. Her primary focus for the past 10 years has been the upper respiratory disease in dogs. As clinical director of the Cambridge Brachycephalic Obstructive Airway Syndrome, BOAS, research group, she has been instrumental in introducing an objective, non-invasive assessment of airway function, identifying risk factors for BOAS, clinical diagnosis, reproduction guidelines, and the development of new surgical techniques. Damos la bienvenida a la doctora Jane Ladlow de Reino Unido, quien nos va a platicar en su ponencia sobre el síndrome obstructivo braquicefálico de las vías respiratorias, una guía para la clasificación funcional respiratoria. Tiene 20 años de experiencia como especialista en cirugía de pequeñas especies, clínica, investigadora docente y conferencista. Su enfoque principal durante los últimos 10 años ha sido la enfermedad de las vías respiratorias superiores en perros. Como directora clínica del Grupo de Investigación del Síndrome Obstructivo Braquicefálico de las Vías Respiratorias de Cambridge, ha sido fundamental su trabajo en la introducción de una evaluación objetiva y no invasiva de la función de las vías respiratorias, identificando los factores de riesgo de BOAS, el diagnóstico clínico, las pautas de reproducción y el desarrollo de nuevas técnicas quirúrgicas como cirugías laringias. Bienvenida, doctora Jane. Un fuerte aplauso, por favor. Buenos días. I'm really sorry the rest is in English. Okay. Um, thank you very much for your kind invitation to talk. And um, it's a great honor to be here at the FCI's first international conference. The reason I put Nai Che's name up there with me is that we did this work together. And um, a lot of the um, information I'm showing you is our PhD work that we did. Okay. I'm going to just do a little bit on BOAS, not a lot, because that was covered yesterday. Um, but I did want to talk about how we diagnose it, because this is a big issue, and this is really where the questions all started. And then I want to introduce the Respiratory Functional Grading Scheme, or the RFG scheme, which we are now using in the UK. Now, when I started this off in 2003, that makes me old, doesn't it? Um, there were very few French bulldogs, so I was predominantly focused on the English bulldog, um, and the pug, and the French bulldog now has risen exponentially in popularity across the world, okay? So the reason that Boas, I think, is such a big problem is the number of dogs that are affected, okay? So it's a huge increase in the popularity of this breed, which we do not seem to be able to control. So it doesn't matter what we are saying on social media, the message is not actually hitting with the public and they are still buying the dogs, okay? Usually without a lot of thought. Now, when we talk about brachycephaly, as um, Dr. Lemos said yesterday, it's about the width and the length of the skull. So everybody gets slightly focused on the length of the nose, and I am, yeah, I'm interested in it, but it's really the width of the head that is super important as well. So I tend to regard this as a flat-faced disease, okay? So it's flat face. And when we talk about BOAS, we're talking about brachycephalic obstructive airway syndrome, it's an umbrella term, and that's a tricky one because we know not all these dogs are affected, and we also know that breeds are affected to different extents. So I would much prefer to call it bulldog obstructive airway syndrome, pug obstructive airway syndrome, and make it more breed specific, but I think that's too complicated at the moment, okay? But it is different in each breed. Whoops. <laughs> Okay, so unfortunately, I had a very nice picture of a French bulldog to show you the lesion sites, but let's skip on from that one, okay? So this is our nasal grading system that we developed, and it is relatively um, loose, so it's descriptive, okay? So the bit that we are interested in is the top area here, the dorsal area, because that's where the airflow goes in, okay? So for an open nostril, we are looking for an obvious wide gap dorsally. And then for the mild nostril, we are looking for a gap dorsally. Now, if you look at the moderate synotic nostrils, across all three breeds, there is no gap. And the severely synotic nostrils, there's no gap either dorsally or ventrally. Now, at the moment, we are saying that open and mildly synotic nostrils are acceptable in our brachycephalic breeds. 
because when you look at our data set, they have a less um, increased risk of BOAS. And we don't like the moderately and severely stenotic nostrils, okay? So nostrils are really critical to this disease. The other thing I like to do is look at the mobility of the nostril. So the nostril is a dynamic structure. And in many of our dogs, you have got movement, lateral movement when the animal is exercising or panting or excited. And you will also see this in the mesocephalic dogs. Now, our dogs with severe stenosis have got no movement at all of that nostril, okay? So it's not just the fact that they are narrowed, they are also not mobile. So it's a double whammy effectively. And you can see the skin being sucked in behind the nostrils, okay? So the nostril in all of our breeds is critical. Now, I'm moving a little bit further back now, and I'm now in the nasal cavity. And this is work that was really highlighted by Gerhard Ochtering from Leipzig. And um, it really is work that's come over in the last 10 years because we needed ways to look at the nasal cavity. So if people say, well, this wasn't highlighted 50 years ago, this is because we couldn't look at this area. Okay, now we have CT scans, we have MRI scans, we have rhinoscopy, we can see what's happening in the nose. And the nasal area is really important in many of our brachycephalic breeds, particularly the French Bulldog. So if we have too many turbinates in the nose, it obstructs the airflow and it stops these dogs from having nice nasal breathing. And you can recognize these dogs because they will be heat intolerant. He's trying to pant to cool himself down, but he can't, okay? So if you don't have nasal, good nasal airflow, you cannot lose heat as a dog. They also tend to switch to mouth breathing very quickly, and the French Bulldogs will also regurgitate, okay? And these are dogs that will also struggle to sleep at night. So dogs are obligate nasal breathers. So if you block their nose, they will have sleep disorders. Now, this is an area we're looking at recently as well, which is above the soft palate. So this is a nasopharynx. And what we've got here is a dog where we're going through a CT, and this is the narrowed area of the nasopharynx. Now, I've already operated on this dog. I have not cured him, because I cannot hit this area, okay? So this is a very, very tricky area for us, and this is coming up as a really important prognostic factor in the French bulldogs that have got BOAS, okay? So these are areas that we cannot alter by surgery. Long soft palate, this is a little bit easier as a surgeon. So this is your typical bulldog, but we also see this problem in the pugs, and these guys tend to be the awake snorers. Um, they also will often have problems eating, so they will choke, they'll struggle with their food, they'll be slow eaters. That's palate. Now, I've moved a little bit further back. I'm now at the entrance to the airway, the rimoglottis or the larynx, okay? This is a pug lesion, okay? So this is what we're seeing in the pugs, and they have very soft cartilages. So this is inspiration, inspiration. This is not laryngeal paralysis or paresis. This is excessive inspiratory pressure stopping that larynx from opening, okay? And then, unfortunately, you get little pockets of mucosa that are called laryngeal saccules that pop up, and now we've obstructed the entrance to the airway. And this is something we see predominantly in the pug. Okay, this is pugs. Now, you can recognize laryngeal disease relatively easily because it creates a higher pitched noise. You get a strider when the larynx collapses. And we do grade the laryngeal collapse in different ways, uh, depending on severity. And it's this noise, it's a high pitched noise. This is the pug. I'm gonna move on. Now, we're now a little bit further down, we're in the trachea, okay? This is a bulldog problem, also seen in the Boston Terriers, okay? But predominantly bulldog. And we get the hyperplastic trachea. It's not a collapsing trachea. The collapsing trachea belongs to the pug. The bulldog and the French bulldog trachea is a rigid trachea. It does not collapse, but it is small often, okay? And these tend to be puppies that will present to three to four months of age, and they will aspirate, and they will present with pneumonia. Now, often when you get these guys through this, this time, then they will actually be fine when they're older. They don't need surgery, 
but they shouldn't be bred from, okay? So this is a bulldog issue. So when I looked at this, we had a problem in the fact that the disease was very subjective and it was dependent on clinical signs and some people would look at a dog's nostrils and if they were tight, they would say they had BOAS. They don't, okay? And other people would say if the dog was snoring and awake, it's fine, it's typical for the breed. It's not, okay? So the first thing we had to do was define the clinical signs. If you cannot define something, you cannot measure it, okay? So first thing, let's define what we are talking about when we talk about BOAS. Now, this is difficult to do at an annual veterinary examination where you're vaccinating, talking about the anal glands, checking the nutrition. So it's often better to separate this and to do it at a separate visit. Now, the other thing we needed to do was come up with an objective method of measuring respiratory function. Because if you want to see which bits are important and you want to see how to improve things, you have to be able to measure it, okay? I was really naive when I thought about this and little did I know it was gonna take me 10 years to sort it out, um, but I think we're getting there. Now, one thing I would like to reiterate is that after 20 years of doing this, I can still not look at dogs and decide which ones are good or bad breeders from the way they look. Okay, I cannot do it. Although I have to say, I really don't like this dog and I think he's about to bite me. So, so this one I'm not happy with. But I don't think with the others, I would get it necessarily correct if I told you which ones are affected and which ones aren't just by looking at them. What about imaging? Can we CT these dogs? Well, it's expensive, but we can. Okay, and on the right-hand side, whoops, sorry guys, pressed on too much there. On the right-hand side, we have a dog that has got no boas at all. This is a really nice French bulldog. He's got a nice, thin, short, soft palate. He's got a very decent nasal cavity, okay? That's excellent. On the left-hand side here, we have a very affected French bulldog with a very thickened tongue. He has a hyperplastic palate, so that palate is thick and it's long, and he has an obstructed nasal cavity, okay? This one is easy. I'm going the wrong way. What about this one, guys? So who thinks that A is the affected bulldog? So one of these bulldogs is about to croak and the other one is absolutely fine, can run for ages, okay? So who thinks A is affected? Come on, guys, be brave. A affected, I got one A affected down there, okay? Who thinks B is affected? Okay, I've got a few more Bs, okay? Who doesn't know? Okay, yeah, right. So even on CT imaging, and you will find lots of studies that say the goal diagnosis for BOAS is CT rubbish. We have not specified on the CT measurements what is affected and what isn't. And we probably can't for a long time because these dogs are so variable, right? So B is actually a really beautiful, unaffected bulldog, apart from the fact it's super fat, okay? Has a nice trachea. And A was a grade three severely affected bulldog, okay? So it isn't easy just with the imaging either. So this is the whole body barometric plasmograph. And this is a, um, effectively a transducer um, chamber. So we've got bias airflow across the chamber, two transducers in the top. And we were very lucky that we started with the breeder's dogs. Why? Because the breeder's dogs are used to being crated and they sat. And you can get some really nice data from this. So it gives you a respiratory flow trace here. So this is respiratory function against time. We've got inspiration and expiration, okay? And we spent quite a long time collecting data. That's a little bit of an underestimate there, guys. Um, and we went to a lot of dog shows um, and we talked to a lot of breeders. And we initially started off with about 200 in our, in our database and now we're over 2,000. And we had fun. So this is inspiration and this is expiration. And these are the kind of respiratory flow traces we were getting. So this top trace here is a completely unaffected French bulldog. Okay, so that trace will be very similar in a Labrador and a Beagle. Okay, this is a nice French bulldog. The middle trace is what we would call a fixed obstruction. So there is something in that airway that is restricting nice flow it could be the nostrils, it could be the nasal cavity, it could be the trachea, okay? It's a French bulldog, it's probably nasal. 
And then the bottom trace has got a dynamic obstruction. There is something that is forming a valve effect at the beginning of expiration. Okay, so we call this dynamic, soft palate, could be nostrils, could be larynx. So for a long time, we could eyeball traces and say this one is affected and this one isn't. And then we managed to work with the stats department, and this is Nai PhD data as well, and we came out with a numerical score of how affected these dogs are. Okay, so this is our BOAS index. And we used parameters that are used in the human literature um, to recognize respiratory obstruction. So it's minute volume over body weight, it's peak expiratory flow over peak inspiratory flow, and it's expiratory time over inspiratory time. Okay, and using this, we came up with a score where the cutoff for being affected was about 50%. It's slightly different in each breed, but it's about 50%, okay? And this is a little bit of a game changer because now we can measure things. Now, for a long time, when owners came to see them, we would give them the parameters from the plasmography. We would give them the chance of their dog developing bias or having bias, but we also gave them the functional grade. And this is what we clinically thought their dogs were uh, having evaluated them. And when it became apparent that the genetics um, was taking a lot longer than I had anticipated, and it's still taking longer than I had anticipated, then I did think that the functional grade is a way that we could easily um, at least give the breeders some idea of which dogs to use. Now, the plasmographic chamber is great. It's expensive. And it's incredibly time-consuming. You need to be trained on it, and you need your own data set, okay? So the idea that you can buy a plasmography chamber and then it's gonna be suddenly working for you is wrong, okay? And it takes a lot of time. So that's not really practical in the clinical situation, and it's not an easy test to rule out, to rule out, roll out across the country, okay? So the, the plasmograph was good, but it's not practical for screening. So we based our clin uh, clinical functional test on the respiratory noise, okay? So the noise these dogs were making. This is Sturter. I need to kind of cut that one a bit. Um, so that's an awake snorer, okay? And that's typically palate or nasopharynx, okay? So nasal nasopharynx palate will create that kind of noise. This is Strider. This is larynx, okay? So that's larynx. If you hear that in a brachycephalic dog, it's larynx. Then this is also stertor, but it's nasal stertor. So it's low pitched again. You can cut that one. So the respiratory functional grading system is pretty straightforward, really. So what we do is we listen to these dogs, we listen to the chest, and then we listen to the side of the neck in a neutral position. And then we do a three minute exercise test. Now, this is not a tolerance test. This is just a way of increasing your airway um, re requirements. So we're trying to increase your oxygen demand um, and just see what happens, okay? And then we will grade the dogs on the highest um, noise that they have either before or after the test. The equipment you need for this is a stethoscope. Why do we include the exercise test? because it makes it easier for us to diagnose BOAS. And we saw lots of dogs, often bulldogs, often pugs, that they were quite relaxed with their owners and they had a nice low respiratory rate. But as soon as they did anything, then they had obvious airway disease, okay? So this is a one-year-old bulldog. A little bit of nasal noise, but nothing too exciting. It's nostril. This is after three minutes, just three minutes. This is the same dog when it's recovered and it's nice and quiet in the consult room, okay? Now, when we started out, we were told that we were making the disease. We're not making the disease. Most dogs should be able to exercise for three minutes without showing that kind of obstruction, okay? So, and I think the breeders now, having seen so many good dogs go through, understand this. Now, we looked at different kinds of exercise, um, and for us, we are far more sensitive, 40% more sensitive, 
diagnosing BOAS if we use a trot test and if we don't use a test, okay? So consult room versus exercise test, 40% more sensitive. We are more sensitive on a trot test than we are on a walk test. So if we walk the dogs, that's the last graph here, okay, we're more likely to diagnose them with BOAS if we trot them, okay? And it's a three-minute trot, so it's pretty, pretty um, swift to do, and you can do the whole assessment in about 15, 20 minutes. Now, another question we had is, is Strider laryngeal? And the reason we had to answer this... I'm so sorry, guys. You're going to have Strider absolutely solid soon. Um, the reason we had to answer this was because it wasn't in the literature, okay? So for years, I've been teaching my students that Strider is laryngeal, not in the literature. So we checked it, and it is laryngeal, okay? So if you hear Strider in a pug, in a French bulldog or a bulldog, then it is laryngeal, okay? Now, the only thing I would say is you have to be a little bit careful because it's not 100% um, specific. So you get occasional dogs that will have laryngeal disease with no strider, but if you hear that strider, the dog has got laryngeal disease, okay? And then the French bulldog and the bulldog particularly, that's really significant because that tells you you've got severe airway disease. So this is how we devise the grading system. So the grade zero dogs have got no airway noise at all when you listen to them with a stethoscope before or after exercise. They are completely as any other dog, okay? So nothing, right? The grade one dogs have got mild noise, so you can hear it with a stethoscope before or after exercise. Now, we have been repeatedly challenged about this because, you know, the grade one dogs have got some noise. Yes, they have, but they have minimal clinical um, signs, okay? So these grade one dogs can exercise, they can sleep, they can eat, okay? So I am actually pretty happy to say grade one dogs are pretty much unaffected, okay? So the grade one dogs for me, if we get all our dogs to grade one, we'll be doing really well. Now the grade two dogs have got noise that you can hear without a stethoscope, okay? It's really straightforward. If they are breathing and you can hear that breathing without a stethoscope, they have got moderate BOAS in our scheme. And the grade three dogs have got severe BOAS, and they have got obvious signs of um, dyspnea. Now, dyspnea is a difficult term. It's a human term that has suffering in it, which is tricky. So we have explained dyspnea in our grading scheme as dogs that can only concentrate on breathing after exercise. So these dogs will not socially interact. They are not going to do anything else. They are just heaving and breathing. And we have licensed this uh, scheme with the Kennel Club and the University of Cambridge, um, and we launched it in 2019. Now, we did put some breeding guidelines with it for the UK, and what we have said is about 15% of our dogs are grade three, and these are our show dogs, okay? This was the old data, so this is 2010 to 16. So we think it's reasonable not to breed the grade three dogs because there is a welfare issue for that individual dog as well as a risk to the progeny, okay? So the grade three dogs should not be bred with. Now the grade two dogs are still about 30% of our dogs. If we take those out completely in the UK, we will drop the population too quickly, okay? So the grade two dogs, we are saying you can breed them, but please be careful and breed them to grade zero and grade one dogs, okay? And the grade zero and grade ones, go ahead. So this is relatively early in the scheme. And then we had a little bit of a problem with this thing called COVID. Um, but these are the numbers that are coming through. Now, I think you can see that the breeders are prioritizing their good dogs. Okay? So this does not mean that the bulldogs are suddenly become increasingly healthy in the UK. What it means is the breeders know which dogs are affected. Well, that's half your battle, okay? So if you go to the dog shows now, you do not hear affected dogs, particularly in the bulldogs. At Crest this year, I heard one out of 40 bulldogs where I got audible breathing. That's remarkable. 15 years ago, you could hear their breathing before you opened the doors, okay? So the breeders understand this system as well as I do now, and they are prioritizing the dogs that are good. Does that matter? As long as they're breeding from those dogs, it doesn't matter. And most breeders, as I think you guys will uh, agree, they don't want to breed diseased dogs. They are looking to breed healthy dogs. So if they understand the system and they are prioritizing their healthy dogs, I think we're doing okay. 
Now, these are some of our good dogs. So these are grade zero one bulldogs. Panting is fine. Panting is allowed, okay? Every dog pants, okay? I have to put that up because everyone goes, oh, it's making, no, it's panting. This lady here is 11 years old, okay? I've been following her for a few years, 11 years old. Okay, I like that. These are our grade zero pugs coming through. Same dog after exercise, okay? We are seeing these dogs, okay? These dogs are definitely out there. This is our grade three pug. I'm just gonna move on. Grade two French Bulldogs. It's not rocket science, you can hear them, okay? Now, what did we feed back to the breeders? Because we had some information on confirmation. What can we tell the breeders? Um, we can tell them a little bit of information. So the first thing we can say is the breeds are different, the skull shapes are different, and those respiratory characteristics are also different, okay? So the red is the bulldog, uh, the green is the French bulldog, and the blue is the pug. And there is some overlap. These dogs on, on the left-hand side here, these are our control dogs. The yellow is the control dogs, the, the beagles we were using. So there is also overlap with the mesocephalic dogs, okay? So the grade zero dogs overlap with the mesocephalic dogs. Now, the grade three dogs, which are in the paler colors, have a lot more variation in their breathing, okay, which I think we recognize clinically as well. Now, these are our initial data set, and we can't easily repeat this because when I first walked into the dog shows, and believe me, I wasn't popular, when I first walked in, the breeders did not know what I was doing, okay? Now the breeders know exactly what I'm doing, and they will give me all their good dogs, okay? So if I did do this now, then I'm going to put up unaffected dogs, okay? But it doesn't really represent what's happening, okay? Um, but this was our initial study. Now, when I started this off, I thought the bulldogs would be more affected. Why? Because a, a really affected bulldog hits you so hard, you can't miss it, okay? But actually, the pugs are more affected. So 60% of the pugs are affected, 40% of the bulldogs. And I think this is true, okay? So the pugs are much easier at hiding it. It's not so obvious. But those pugs have still got airway disease. And the French bulldogs are sitting somewhere in the middle. And remember, this is our show population. This is not pet dogs. This is our show population. Now, what else can we tell you? We can tell you that in the pug, obesity is super important to the extent that if you put a body condition score grade one on a pug, then you are going to increase its airway obstruction by 7%. So if a pug comes in and it's a grade nine and you drop it to a grade six, then you are likely to take about 20% of airway function off or the obstruction off, which means you move it from severely affected to moderate or from moderate to unaffected, okay? So obesity in pug is a really important factor. Now, pugs like to eat. They have the same obesity genes that Labradors have. So it is not easy to diet these pugs. Um, so we sat down with the breeders a few years ago and we devised a visual score. It's not validated, but it works for the pugs, we think. And we are looking at the pugs from the tuck up and from the dorsal aspect to try and make it easier to body condition score these dogs. And we are saying to the breeders, please do not put the eights and nines in the ring, okay? The eights and the nines are too fat. You are damaging their airway. Please keep them out of the ring. Um, I would like them all to be fives and sixes. We are still seeing sevens in the ring. I was super happy last year. This was a northern pug show in the UK. These are the size of the pugs that are coming through. These are fantastic, okay? These pugs were grading really well. And I regraded some pugs that I had graded four years previously, and they graded as lower, even though they were four years older, because they were not fat. What else could we feed back? Nostrils, okay? The nostrils are super important. And if you look at the purple, those are the dogs that have got severely stenotic nostrils, and the grade three dogs are over here, right? So you are far more likely to have grade three severe bias if you've got stenotic nostrils. And that's across all of our breeds, okay? And this is a confirmational paper that we published a few years ago, and there were 200 dogs in each breed, so it's not a, a bad population. So these are our confirmational risk factors from the external confirmation. And this makes up about 40 to 50% of the BOAS variation. So 
in all breeds, nostrils first. Okay, so if you want to improve your breed, you head for the nostrils. The second thing in the pug was obesity. And then we have a wider eye distance, a wider and shorter head. Okay, so that width of head is really important. And then the females in our data set were more affected. Now, other data sets have said male, so I'm not sure gender is significant. In the French Bulldog, we have nostrils first. Then we have a shorter nose and a shorter and thicker neck. Okay, so we like the dogs with a longer, slimmer neck. And that usually goes with a longer back. And that, I think, is also related to the incidence of IVDD that we are seeing in the French Bulldogs, which is high. And we see now French Bulldogs coming into the ring that are very short. And I think those dogs have got a couple of issues that they're going to have to face. One is BOAS and the other is probably disc disease. And then we look at the Bulldogs and it's nostrils again. It's the wider and shorter head. And then it's the thicker neck. Okay, so there's a chest girth ratio um, compared to your neck of 0.7, which gives you a really good cutoff in a male Bulldog, whether it will be affected or not. So with the breeders in the UK, I've asked them to go back to the old fashioned brick head. They know exactly what I'm talking about. You don't want the big round head if you want good, healthy bulldogs. Now, what about this cranial facial ratio? Because we hear about this the whole time. And we definitely got a significant trend in French bulldogs. So in French bulldogs, if you have a longer nose, you are less likely to have boas. We didn't see it in pugs, but pugs do not have a lot of variation. We also didn't see it in the Bulldogs, and the Bulldogs do have variation, okay? So craniofacial ratio may have some importance, but it's certainly not the only important factor, and I don't think it is the most important factor. And why is that? Well, if you look at the craniofacial ratio, the only bit that actually sits in the nasal area is the nasal vestibule. So it's the nostrils and the alar folds. The majority of the nasal cavity sits under the skull. So if you want to improve the health of the dog, you have to improve the length of the whole head, okay? Not just the nose, but the whole head. This is just, I like putting this picture up. This is another of our Frenchies that are completely unaffected, okay? So, so the reason this worked is because we have unaffected dogs. And this guy is seven now, and he's still unaffected. Now, I'm just going to move on a little bit now to which brachycephalic breeds. So all that work was done in the bulldog, the pug and the French Bulldogs. And the RFG scheme is not validated for the other breeds because I don't know what the other breeds are like. So we thought we'd look at this now. So we've looked at 13 other breeds and we've included most of the dogs that are classically, um, uh, classically regarded as brachycephalic. So we've got Griffins in there, we've got the Affen Pinchers in there and we've got the Boxer in there. Interestingly, in the UK, the boxers are lovely, okay? So very, very rare to pick up any airway disease in the boxer in the UK. And the boxers actually have old dogs at the show. So this includes dogs who are 10, 11, 12 years of age, okay? It's really nice. Affen pinches, we haven't picked up much at all, apart from collapsing trachea, which is a toy breed problem, not a brachy problem, okay? So different breeds are coming up with different lesions, but not certainly um, all boas. So this is our list of dogs. We do functional assessments, uh, we do plasmography in a number, and we're doing CT scans in a number. And to do a CT scan, I have to do a dental. So my PhD student and I are spending Monday mornings dentaling. It's not my ideal way to spend a Monday morning, but we're doing it, okay? This is some of our initial data. So this is not our published data. We're only still in the collection phase. Um, but none of the dogs so far, the breeds, are affected to the same extent as the pug, the bulldog, or the French bulldog, okay? The Pekingese in the UK is affected, um, but things like the King Charles, not a huge amount of affected dogs in there. Boxers, minimal, and the same thing with the Affen Pinchers. So we're still collecting data. I think we're over 500 dogs now, and I think we have to get to 780 dogs. Um, we've started doing a little bit of analysis on this data. And the most important factor, whether a dog will have BOAS in any breed, is the nostril, okay? So in every single breed that we are looking at, the nostril is the most important conformational factor. I work with a very nice team. Um, I should sort of also put up around my new PhD student now. So this is done by a, a group of people um, over a long time, unfortunately, um, but that's where we are. Um, I'm happy to take questions now.
Thank you very much, um, Dr. Jane. Any questions? Uh, first of all, I would like to thank your dedication, your flexibility with us, and your professionalism. Um, when we first met, we immediately agreed we have to do something together. Um, and only one thing I, I would like to announce. We started to talk about it this morning during having a coffee. If uh, Dr. Ledlow, maybe, it's not yet settled, can do a training theoretical and practical training for FCI-related veterinarians. It will not be before May or June. A lot of things has to be settled. For example, she's partly working to deacon a club, also needs an agreement from there. Uh, the only reason why I warn you it can happen, because it's something like six months' time. So if you go home, it's about time to collect and contract those veterinarians who possibly could be thought how to make the job, how to make the grading after a professional training in your own country to use the system. Once more, chapeau and thank you. Okay. I promised Nerel she could ask a question now. Thank you, Gary. Thank you for that very educational um, PowerPoint presentation and uh, and your words about um, boas. Um, I don't own a brachycephalic breed, but um, I'm just asking the question: Is boas um, is can it happen in metacephalic and dosicephalic breeds? So when we talk about boas, we're talking about brachycephalic, so it's conformational related. Now you can get upper airway disease in other breeds. So we see it obviously in the Norwich Terrier. Um, and I think we sometimes see it in the Staffordshire Bull Terrier, which is on the cusp. So the honest answer is I don't know because I haven't looked at enough breeds in the detail I've looked at the brachycephalic breeds to say that we definitely see it in, you know, in just in brachycephalics and not in other breeds. But I think we very rarely see the same kind of conformational issues in other breeds. Now, the one that's interesting that's coming through is the American Bulldog. And we are seeing some very, um, how do I say it, um, exaggerated American Bulldogs in the UK. And they have an incredibly thick and wide head. So I think if you were to look at them on the brachycephalic index, they would still be brachycephalic. So it's not the length of the nose that's causing them issues, it's the width of the head, okay? Um, but I don't think I've seen airway disease that I would consider similar to brachycephalic in other breeds. And obviously bull terriers can get laryngeal um, stenosis, but that's a specific to lesion to the bull terrier. So I think no, I think this is mainly brachycephalic, whether it's width or length. Okay. Any other questions? Muchas gracias por la presentación. Muchas gracias por la presentación, padrísima. Felicidades. Eh, yo tengo dos preguntas. A ver si te seguí. La primera, si ¿sí se puede eh, tener remedio con estos perros que ya tienen el mal si los operas. ¿Es correcto? So, are you a student here? You student here? No, 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 no. no. So I have a lot of lectures on surgery because I'm a surgeon, okay? Um, so the, obvious, the ob honest answer is you can improve them, okay? And it depends where the lesion site is. So most bulldogs are a little bit trickier, I find, to, to operate on, but they usually do really well. The French bulldogs are much more challenging because it's often in the nose, 
And you then have to sometimes come back and do the laser turbinectomy. And then even then, you don't always get them sorted because of that nasopharyngeal area. So we can improve most dogs. Some dogs I can cure because I take them back to not clinical. But this is not really a surgical disease. And this is why I'm standing here. The best way to get rid of this disease is to breed it out, okay? And we are deluding ourselves as surgeons. And I'm a surgeon if we think we are curing these dogs because we are not, okay? Aha, gracias. Y la segunda cuestión es, ¿hay algún medicamento que los haga eh, respirar mejor o no existe? Not really. So you can use things like xylometazoline, which is an alpha-3 agonist, which works beautifully at the time of surgery, but you can't use it long term, okay? It's really bitter and it also has rebound. We can use antacids to stop the reflux, but there is nothing really to improve what is unfortunately anatomical lesions. Okay. Hi, Jane. <laughs> Um, I'm going to go on to talk about the illegal puppy trade and obviously we've had a lot of um, puppies come through that have been extremely uh, badly bred, French bulldogs in particular, and um, how can we really, and I know that people have bought French bulldogs have been imported and then they've gone on to breed them, how are we going to sort of outbreed it in, when it's so wide amongst the public and I understand you're working with breeders but big big thing with um, the public. So this is a really interesting question and we haven't solved this yet. So we have been standing up and saying, please don't buy dogs from in the internet. Intelligent people will go onto Gumtree and purchase a dog and then they bring it to me and I give them a big bill and feel gratified that I do that, right? Because they don't deserve anything. Why would you do it, you know? So I, I, the education and the assured breeders and the going through people that, that you know is so important. But the honest answer is if we used all our breeders that are, are good and registered in the UK or Kennel Club Assured, we wouldn't produce enough dogs. So until we can hit the popularity of these dogs, I don't quite know what we do. The illegal puppy trade is a massive issue. The dogs that are imported are usually unhealthier, not healthier than our dogs. And we don't know what diseases or what lesions they have. Um, also, the banning the breed, I'm going to bring this up because you guys may know that I was probably one of the only vets that stood up and did the Norwegian trial recently and I felt a little bit awkward about that. But banning dogs is really difficult because you push people into the dark areas and you won't necessarily then have any idea what's happening and the crossbreeds we are seeing are not necessarily better. So even if you say outcrossing is better, you have to do it in such a careful way to know that what you're getting actually doesn't have the issue and nobody's organizing that or regulating that. So I would much prefer to work with the breeders, but how we hit the popularity, I don't know. And there's so many people now, you, I sat in a pub a few years ago and somebody had a French bulldog and then he went, no, no, I've got one and the staff brought theirs out and everybody in that pub seemed to have a French bulldog. It had to be so quiet. So I don't know how we get the message across. I think all I, I can do is try and protect the people that are working properly to produce decent dogs and protect the breeders that are actually on the, on the breeding scheme so that at least they can say, well, we have tried everything we can do. And hopefully at some stage, the public will notice that if they buy a dog from over here, they have a long life pet. And if they buy a dog from over there, they have a big vet bill and a heartbreak, right? So maybe that's the only thing we can do. Any, any ideas welcomed for that, guys? Because we haven't won yet. Thank you very much, Dr. Jane Ladlow. Fantastic presentation. I want to thank the FCI board members for giving Mexico the opportunity of having this important World Congress for Welfare and Health for the dogs worldwide. We are really pleased and thank you so much for giving us this great opportunity. And also I want to thank all the speakers from all over the world who participate in this great event. Thank you. <laughs>